Welcome to the Grant, well, to Imperial College um, and to this event hosted by the Grantham Institute as well as, well as Armad Sok. I'm the Director of Policy at the Grantham Institute, and for those of you who don't know, the purpose of the Institute is to act as a bridge between the academics at this university and also to a certain extent elsewhere, between their research and people out there in the policy and business community, to, and as well as sort of NGO world, to make sure that decisions are being made well on the basis of the evidence we have and making sure that we're tackling climate change. And this is part of that kind of agenda that we have. Other things that we do at the Grantham Institute are encouraging some of our academics to get out there and talk about the work that they do and training and upskilling them so that they can do that, um, as well as supporting multidisciplinary and new research that crosses boundaries to help tackle climate change and supporting entrepreneurs and innovators in tackling some of our climate uh, challenges. Uh, at the end of this event, or maybe now, but not while it's going on, do go to the website and sign up for our newsletter, which comes out every week, and we'll give you more information about our activities and our event. And follow us on Twitter, uh, because we've got lots of good activity and information coming out of the Institute all the time. So the purpose of today's event is to give you the opportunity to meet, in a little bit more of a personal way, two of the authors of the IPCC report that was launched last week, uh, globally and in London just this morning, as part of the European launch. That IPCC report is a special report of the IPCC. And just to give you a, a feeling of where that came from, for those of you who don't know, in, in 2015, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change was agreed between nations. And as part of that agreement at government level, they invited the IPCC, which is the panel of scientists who provide information to help policymakers make policy on climate change. They've invited the IPCC to write a special report on what one and a half degrees of uh, global warming post pre-industrial age might actually mean, and what kind of pathways could keep us to one and a half degrees warming alone. Part of the purpose of that report was to feed then back into the political process. So when politicians go back to Poland for the next conference of the parties to the United Nations Framework Convention in December, they'll be able to now have this report with them. And as you all saw at the beginning of, of last week, this report emphasizes the urgent need for those same governments to take action as soon as possible. So in that context, once the IPCC was invited to write this report, shortly after they had to find some people to write it for them, and two of those people are here. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce uh, Professor Miles Allen, uh, who was a coordinating lead author on Working Group 1, or Chapter 1, Chapter, chapter one. 1, not Working Group 1, Chapter 1 of this special report, and Yuri Rogel, who was a uh, coordinating lead author of Chapter 2. And I'm going to give them each the opportunity now to speak for a little while about their experience of writing on the report. Uh, and then after that, there'll be quite a bit of opportunity for questions and conversation. So if I turn to Miles first. Sure. So um, I, had the, I had the very easy job on this report. I was uh, responsible for the questions of, you know, where are we at? Um, how close are we to 1.5? Uh, and what is you know, in physical terms, what does it mean to, to get there and, and what, what's required? That, that's the kind of framing and context that Chapter 1 had to address. Uh, we also had to look at um, introducing the sort of key concepts required for the rest of the report. Um, and I, for those of you who don't know how these things work, um, the, we, 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 wrote the, we, wrote, we write a report consisting of five chapters, um, assessing the literature. It's not, it's not the job of the IPCC to actually do any research. We're looking at papers, um, saying what they, what they tell us um, about the questions which were posed for this, for this report. Um, and then um, we write a, a summary. And the thing which happened, the event which happened in Korea was a process of governments going through the summary we'd written to check that we'd written an accurate summary of the underlying report and that in turn, that the underlying report was a balanced assessment of the literature. Um, and they go through paragraph by paragraph, sentence by sentence, checking this, uh, this, this summary and, and querying um, sentences that they feel may not be balanced or may sort of be prescriptive in some way or other. Um, to, because it's not our job to tell people what to do. It's our job just to tell them what the literature says, the, the, the situation we're in. So I think I was. And you, you, you've actually done quite well here, because I think I was the first author up defending one of the sentences uh, on the podium, and I think Yuri was the last. Um, so you can tell I had the easy end of the week, and Yuri had the other end. Um, so uh, and anyway, the, the focus, therefore, of what I was uh, about was, you know, where are we? 
you know, now at one degree, what's happening, warming at 0.2 degrees per decade, what does that mean? I mean, in a sense, it was incredibly easy because, you know, if you're at one degree warming at 0.2 degrees per decade, you don't need to be a climate modeler to work out what needs to happen if you're going to slow down in time to avoid going past 1.5 degrees. And you also don't need to be a climate model to work out that it's got to happen fairly quickly. And one of the things that actually was, at, was quite, um, so far, I've been quite pleased about in the reaction to this report is quite how little reaction there's been on my bits. It's, everybody's like, yeah, so we knew that. Um, okay, that's good. That's 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 where we're at, um, and uh, uh, rather more reaction on Yuri's bit. So that might be a good point to hand over. Okay, very good. I know it's it's working. Yeah. Um, yeah, just like Miles, I was also a coordinator. Um, yeah. Didn't do anything here. You might need to move it up a bit. If that if it starts doing that. Solve the problem. <coughs> that solves the problem. They can hear you anyway. Know. They can hear me? Yeah, good. Um, yeah, as Miles, I was a coordinating lead author, uh, but this time on Chapter 2. And Chapter 2 looks at uh, mitigation pathways that are compatible with limiting warming to one and a half. And, and Chapter 2 had to do that in the context of sustainable development. Um, maybe it's, it's interesting, in addition to what Miles already said, to say how, how one gets involved in the IPCC. And, um, in a way, um, authors to the IPCC are nominated by governments or by institutions uh, to serve as a lead author or coordinating lead author. And after that, the IPCC Bureau, from the many nominations, um, makes a selection of authors that is, has the right expertise, has the right regional balance, uh, has the right gender balance, um, so, so as to be as a... Uh, as representative author team as possible, and also to be kind of uh, to to be covering all the all the expertise that is needed in each chapter. Um, so what happens then at, at one evening? You know you've been nominated, and then you get a phone call, and someone asks you whether you want to be um, either a coordinating lead author or a lead author, and um, not really knowing what uh, what that journey involves. Um, then you have to say yes or no. And um, so I think that, that happens, happened to both of us. And, and this was kind of about one and a half, year, one and a half two years ago. And uh, little did I know what it actually involved in, in our chapter. So in our chapter, what we did is um, looking at the mitigation pathway literature, we first looked at what are the key requirements in terms of um, in terms of emission reductions that are needed to limit warming to 1.5, uh, or what is the remaining carbon budget? How much carbon dioxide can be still put into, into the atmosphere while stimming, still limiting warming to 1.5? In the second part of our chapter, we then looked at uh, if we know how much carbon dioxide we can still emit, how can we nicely or how can we transform our energy system and our societies and our economies so as to stay within this budget. For that, we kind of looked at the entire literature of, of, of pathways, and uh, we, we created a, a large database of these pathways, which today has been published online. So if you're interested in this, please do go online. It has a nice interface. You can kind of play with it uh, and, and, and kind of extract new, uh, new insights. And finally, our chapter then also looked at how do these pathways link to the wider context of sustainable development. Because for the first time, actually, this report, which is one of the exciting things or developments or, or tasks this report was given, uh, it had to look at explicitly <coughs> at climate change mitigation and adaptation in the context of sustainable development. We, uh, of course, within the IPCC and within the UNFCCC, or the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, uh, People care about climate change and about climate change mitigation, but with the sustainable development goals and the other, uh, other societal goals that we have, it is clear that we should not be focusing solely on this one objective. We want to achieve all of them uh, together. So that is really now the first time actually that this report looked at this in a more uh, integrated way, and which I think was one of the very exciting new things in this report. Okay, great. Thanks. Well, that's a good kickoff, I think, from both of you. Have we already got questions in the audience? People got things you want to ask? We can start straight away. Go for it. 
I read this synthesis, not the whole thing. But in the report, and towards the back, when it's talking about the sustainable development goals, there's parts where it's talking about probably we'd need to do redistributive measures to make this fair to people. Um, we probably need to cut consumption. That seems to be the most likely way to make this succeed, things like that. And you said that this was subject to a lot of you know, rigorous debate around making sure it's not bi uh, biased or unfair. But if I were to bring that to kind of like a very conservative person, they would tell me, oh, that's a bunch of hoo-ha still. So can you tell us a little more about kind of how that debate went and how much pushback you got, like, like on things like those statements? Yeah, sure. Um, I think one has to really clearly see that the, the first large debate that, uh, that happens on this topic is within the author teams and uh, within the entire author team of first of the chapter and then within the author teams of the entire report. Uh, what was really interesting about this report is that you, you had authors from very different disciplines. Uh, you had pretty much kind of normal, or no, not normal, but kind of the, the, the standard economical thinker, thinkers. And then you had uh, lots of social scientists that, that come from totally different angles. And so a lot of the debate, actually, I, I would say almost all of the debate on, on these topics, was within the chapters. Ultimately, the, the IPCC cannot be policy prescriptive. So it, it, can be policy, it, it should be policy relevant, but it cannot say what, uh, what has to be done in terms of policies if there are options available. Um, so in that sense, I think that uh, also what, what then finally was elevated into the summary for policymakers are those messages uh, on which there was actually agreement amongst the author team and also uh, drawing up uh, on the evidence that you find in the literature. So those things that are actually robust and, and of which we can have high confidence that, that, they, that they will stand also the questioning that you will then get during the plenary. And yeah, and, and on, on that, I mean, I think it's, uh, I, I, I was really impressed at how much um, this report was able to draw attention to things that kind of everybody knows but have been quite difficult to say in previous IPCC reports and partly because we seem to have just moved on from arguing about the physical science to getting onto these questions about how we actually address the problem. Um, you know, the report was assessing the literature, there were papers in the literature which made it very clear um, the implications of consumption versus supply, you know, supply versus demand measures um, in terms of, uh, I mean, this obviously in Yuri's chapter, but I, I was more a spectator on these discussions. Um, but what was um, interesting to me was that governments in Korea were, the, the government delegations in Korea, were prepared to consider and allow mentioning of I think issues that might, I mean, other people in the room might be better placed to say whether these were sort of third rail words in the past, but it seemed to be a greater willingness to consider these, these things. I mean, ethics and equity and, uh, are both mentioned in there. Um, and, you know, again, a lot of us were wondering, was that actually going to, was that, were those words going to survive in the final um, summary? Because, you know, they obviously raise um, hackles. Um, in some places, um, and by and large, it, it's it's a very seems to be a very robust document. And you know, if it was you know the the process that which you go through, um, governments seem to be being pretty pretty fair in their assessment of it. If it reflected the literature, they said, yeah, okay, fine. Maybe it would be helpful to reflect upon the word consumption and how that looked in terms of what your chapter was about. You mentioned the sort of language that you use of supply side and demand side options. Um, I think sometimes when you hear the word consumption you might think almost that people are being told to live a certain lifestyle or politicians are being told to adopt a certain type of policy or even going as far as saying advocating anti-capitalism, which I don't, mm -hmm. I, I don't think this IPCC report was. So maybe you can expand a bit on that, Yuri, how, where consumption comes in in terms of the modeling and what that means. Yeah, yeah definitely. So um, as you mentioned in your question, so uh, that the, the language that you mentioned, uh, like... Uh, reductions in consumption and so on is, is really in chapter five. So it comes really from a social science literature. Um, in, in the chapter that I coordinated, 
we look at the integrated pathway literature. So basically, um, these are uh, these are pathways that are developed by models that look at the interactions between um, between the agricultural and the energy system, between the energy system and the industrial system, and so on, and try to provide one integrated view of how that this entire complex can change over time. And what that literature shows is indeed that if you want to have any chance, uh, or if if you want to, uh, there, there are certain worlds in which. Uh, these models find solutions to limit warming to 1.5, and there are certain worlds where they don't find. And that's the first important um, finding. And, and for example, there, uh, worlds in which there is no, no cooperation or very limited cooperation, and with increasing inequities, um, none of these models, none of that literature really finds a, uh, find ways to limit warming to 1.5, even not to 2 degrees, by the way. So it's, it's not just a 1.5 thing. But then, com then comes the uh, consumption uh, question, and uh, in what that literature shows is that by focusing on the demand side, and uh, so in that literature uses just demand side measures as a kind of proxy for changing your consumption patterns. Uh, if you focus on the demand side, you have a lot of lot more flexibility uh, to limit to to, st to limit warming to 1.5, and that flexibility is important. Because depending on which strategy you follow, uh, for example, you use lots of bioenergy or you, uh, you try to limit the amount of bioenergy and you use lots of renewables and so on, depending on which strategy you follow, you have different trade-offs and synergies with sustainable development. Some strategies will, will be very good, will be very beneficial for other sustainable development goals, and, and some strategies will actually be detrimental. Um, so that's really something that comes out in our chapter. But what chapter two also finds <coughs> is that it's, it's not necessary to have a reduction in the consumption at the energy service level. So what that means is uh, we don't have to necessarily live uh, or, or have very strong cuts in our level of, of well-being. Uh, but we just need to do it in, in smarter ways and, and, and in... Uh, and in more energy efficient ways. At the same time, this, this is equally a challenge. It, it's, it's, not just, uh, it's, it's not easy, because if it would be easy, it would be done now, because it's already energy efficient, it's, it's exactly economically efficient, it, you would actually be gaining or, or kind of making money by implementing those measures, and they're not, not implemented. So it's definitely not a walk in the park, but, uh, but it's definitely one of the options that, that come out as one of the clear, uh, yeah, one of the options that provide many benefits across many, uh, many areas. Great. OK. Good thorough answer to that question. Let's have a few, a few more hands as well. First question, another question over there. Uh, thanks. Um, the, the rigor of the IPCC process is uh, unchallengeable. Sometimes the language is not. Um, for instance, and I picked this from the, uh, the summary for policymakers, the implementation of land-based mitigation options would require overcoming socio-economic, institutional, technological, financing and environmental barriers. That seems to me a long way of saying it can't be done. Am I wrong? Yes. <laughs> um, and the, the point of these lists and... and, and um, I think I remember one David Warlow once telling me never put a list in a, or never start a list in, a, in a, one of these summaries because it inevitably gets longer as sort of somebody in the room says, well, what about this? Mm, what about this? And, you know, anyway, so um, I think that might be an example of a, of a list that started digestible and perhaps got a little bit longer. Um, but uh, uh, it, 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 it is, they are important because um, these, that, that paragraph will be taken away by the government delegations who are there and then unpacked when, it's, when they get home to say, look, we are going to have to worry about all of these different things if we're actually going to implement land-based solutions um, for, and in that particular example, um, if we uh, you know, attempt to address um, mitigation through land-based solutions. And you know, the fact that there's a list there gives, you know, in a sense, a sort of checklist of things they're going to need to think about. Um, there's, there's more going on, I think, in this process than just 
crafting the words in the, in the summary, um, you're also, you know, it is a dialogue between the scientific community and the government delegates. It's not that they're actually injecting material into the report, but they are making sure that what's in the report and in the summary is clearly understood by everybody there. And I must say, one thing, um, I was really struck by at this meeting, um, but what, you know, the previous substantive um, plenary I'd been to was back, all the way back in 2001 in, in Shanghai um, for the third assessment report. And you know, we were getting questions at that plenary where you sort of were slightly set back and wondering where to begin. On the other hand, at this plenary, every delegation from every country, without exception, was completely on the issues, completely clear about, I mean, sometimes what they wanted seemed to me not consistent with what other delegations wanted, but they, there was no problem about people not understanding what the issues were, including on quite you know, sophisticated points like, you know, like the carbon budget and different ways of measuring global temperature and so on. Everybody you know, completely on top of the issues. And that was really impressive and encouraging in the sense that you know, one would expect the UK to be well represented at such meetings, but, some, but, but you know, we're including here um, single member developing country delegations all you know, completely on, on, on top of it. And of course it's those people who then take these bullets back to their ministers and unpack them. And so in a sense I don't feel bad about the language being not terribly useful for um, you know, Bloomberg Business Week cut and paste. <laughs> it, it's, up to, it's up to Bloomberg Business Week to report on it. Um, the point, this document is written for the governments for them to subsequently use, um, which means it's not always written in, you know, ideal press, um, press release language, um, and, and it, but it addresses their concerns. Great. Well, that's kind of quite an interesting commentary on how the language is sort of co-designed in a way by one of the major stakeholders and audiences. Really interesting. And Yuri, you had something to say. Yeah, I just want to say that these, there, is a, there is a certain process of aggregation of, of barriers, or, or for example, in this sentence, up, up to the summary. So uh, what that sentence definitely means that in, in some contexts, it will indeed not be, a, not be possible to do it. Uh, but those barriers do not have to apply to all, or everywhere in all contexts. And I think, uh, yeah, that's also something that, that comes out in the report, but then in the summary, well, you have to list everything, uh, and, you, and you cannot start listing ev how it differs in every region. It, most of the time it's done five more words. This differs uh, depending on context, and, uh, and, and, and that's how it's codified, uh, with a reference to where to find it, in which section in the report. So I think reflecting upon language is interesting, because the, the language whilst it's helpful to understand the, the, the process, is actually quite special, specialized for a certain audience who will be able to decode it. So then just I wanted to reflect a bit with both of you on last week and the coverage of the report the first time. There was a, there was a, a, a tweet, and I can't remember who to attribute to, that basically said, this report is simply scientists' way of saying, act now, idiots. Scientists, why, don't, why aren't you just saying that? Did you feel like last week, actually, there was accurate, the messaging that you would have liked to have seen was getting out there accurately. Yeah. Well, start? I can start. Yeah. I can start. Um, yes and no. I mean, one, one key message or one key issue that um, the press doesn't seem to get quite right is that scientists are not calling for anything in this report. Scientists and the IPCC were has been asked a question, a clear question on what are the implications for, for, for if we want to limit warming to 1.5, what is the difference in impacts between 1.5 and 2? And, and we provided an answer. Uh, we provide the scientific evidence informing those two questions. And um, well, wh whatever policymakers ultimately after that decide to do with that information is, is not anymore in our hands. And so th that was the one that was the one part that I thought the, the, the press very often got wrong, like scientists call for 1.5 or, or we, we urge governments to, to limit warming to 1.5. Well, the report actually doesn't, does not do that. The, the report just provides the evidence and the, and, the, and the answers to questions that were asked us by the governments. Would you say the same? Uh, yes. I mean, uh, 
you know, I think there were some things were much better reported than others. I mean, the, by and large, the the physical science side was so simple by this stage that the, there was very little for people to get wrong. Um, the economics, um, there were some more challenges. So there was a, I mean, w one thing I could take the opportunity to clear up um, is that um, it was widely reported that meeting 1.5 degrees would cost 2.5% of GDP, uh, which sounds like a, a phenomenal amount of, of money, and it is. Um, but if you actually delve into what was actually said, um, the energy system investment required to meet 1.5 degrees would be 2.5% of GDP, or 2.8% of GDP specifically between now and 2050. Um, but you've also got to remember that not meet, just, just, just investing in the baseline, in, in, the, in, in, the, in the high fossil energy infrastructure would be 2% of GDP over that same period. Mm -hmm. so, so yes, it's more money, um, but clearly for a very different outcome. Um, and that's something which um, I was rather disappointed the um, press did not get right. Um, they just muddled up um, the total for the extra. Um, and when you went back and looked at the paragraph concerned, the extra was in the paragraph. I think they were just being selective, and that was kind of annoying. Um, but certain people just wanted to grab numbers and say this is going to be expensive. Great. Thanks. More questions? Um, first back there. Uh, th thanks. Um, Miles, I mean, you said you were like a bystander against some of the debates, and I think Joey, uh, jo Joey sorry, said you were pretty intensely involved in, in discussions. I just wondered if you would give us a feel for which other areas had intense areas of discussion and maybe some disagreements on, on conclusions, uh, and, and which ones were maybe less so. Uh, I'm thinking of maybe chapter five or four maybe had some discussion. Great. Good question, with the caveat that you may not be able to share that in great detail. But I was going to say, what happens in Incheon stays in Incheon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it does not go on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, but I, I can speak to some of the, uh, of the, um, of the well, not necessarily controversies, but the, but the discussions that were held. Uh, so as, as, as scientists, we went into the plenary, prepared our summary, and we thought everything that is robust will interest governments, and what is, what is not so robust, well, we have limited space, so why bother mentioning it? Um, one, of the, one of the key points that governments commented on is that uh, if you say something about extreme precipitation and you live in a dry land area, uh, you really ask yourself the question, uh, well, what, what, why can't you say anything about us? Uh, we, we're not interested in uh, saying so. so and, then, and then there is kind of, okay, well, again, you, you get the, in, into the list making, eh? what, what needs to be mentioned here, and then, and then after a while you kind of agree, and that's then ultimately it, it's just finding, finding information that, that speaks to all, all members of the IPCC in the room. So... Um, I think that, that, that was an example that, that, that struck me and that, as something that we could have actually anticipated um, if, we, if we thought about it earlier. Yeah, I mean, the, it, it was interesting how much of the time was devoted to physical science and impacts, considering they weren't particularly controversial. Um, and, and then, of course, we get on to the, the economics and mitigation pathways. Oh, I mean... You know, the, the, the chairs managing the meeting were well aware of what was going on, and they did start discussions as soon as they could and sort of try to get them going in parallel. But again, one of the challenges in these meetings is a, a lot of developing countries, uh, there's only one or two people on the delegation. So if you start, if you sort of break the meeting up into a whole spider's web of parallel s sessions running, then it's not very fair on these, um, these small delegations. So, um, you know, there's a kind of a balance they had to, to strike there. Um, yeah, one, I can give one, one additional example of, of uh, a part that a lot of time is spent on. Um, it would be um, figure SPM4, uh, which provides the, the interactions between, uh, between sustainable development and mitigation. And I think most of the time was actually spent on clarifying what was done there. So, um, yeah, it, it is a hugely complex uh, endeavor to kind of uh, assess this wide range of literature and put it into one figure. And, but once that, that it was kind of clarified what, what that meant, it was, also, it was also accepted and it's in, in the SPM now. But I think 
a lot of it was, was really clarification um, and, and, and better understanding of, of how people got to the assessment that they, uh, that they were presenting. Great, great, interesting answers. Right, next up. I think this gentleman at the front was next. The easy part, sorry, the easy part of the climate problem is the one you were addressing. It's saying what needs to be done. The difficult part is saying how do we do it? Who's going to tell a billion in rural Indians to stop burning their cow pats? Who's going to tell the Chinese to stop installing a new power station every month or every fortnight powered by coal? Who's going to tell Donald Trump that his economy where he consumes eight times as much energy per head as the Chinese needs to slow down? So maybe, you know, having obviously clarified that this report was not scientists calling for anything, what would you both hope would be the next steps with this? Yeah, if I can, if I can speak directly to the, to the examples you gave. Um, well, who's going to tell the Indians uh, or rural Indians, well, it's, uh, it's Indian politicians themselves that have decided that they want to uh, provide clean energy to rural, in, to, to rural populations. Um, who, who is going to, uh, what was this, the second the example? Chinese. Chinese, uh, do, to stop building coal-fired power. Well, it's the Chinese themselves that have figured out that they can't solve their air pollution problem if they continue building to build those coal-fired power plants. So. Ultimately, it, it, it is, of course, always a national process uh, to, to implement measures on, on the ground. What I think is this report really nicely does is to provide a, a clear view of the co-benefits and the linkages of, of climate mitigation with other goals, uh, be it reliable and, uh, and clean energy for poor populations, be it air pollution, uh, be it uh, clean water, biodiversity, and I think this really appeals or could appeal more to national policymakers to kind of make their case of why they are doing uh, a specific or why they want to implement a specific measure. And some of the, just to, to add to that, I mean some of the most um, tightly coded language in the report is where, we're, where the report's talking about um, asset stranding and the sort of financial implications of um, a, the, of the transition. Um, and there, again, it's a matter of providing ammunition to, you know, the, the, the people in the room are the people, re representatives of governments who probably understand the issue better than anybody else, often in their country. And then they've got to go back and talk to the minister and, and say, look, this is what the IPCC has just said. Yes, it looks like a whole lot of go gobbledygook, but let me just explain to you. It means that if we buy a coal-fired power station now, there's a chance we won't be able to use it in 30 years' time. Um, is that a risk we want to take, for example? And, you know, that's where the report becomes useful. I mean, in a sense, countries like the UK don't really need the IPCC report. I mean, we, we, you know, but, but where it, it, it provides, you know, you know, where I think it's, 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 a, it, it's the most useful process is where it, is, is where it can feed into national and subnational discussions um, and start conversations going in companies and so on and, and states in the U.S. You mentioned the U.S. I mean, you know, the U.S. is doing a lot better than Germany at the moment in, in actual emissions. Um, I mean, you know, they're making the wrong noises, but the right trends, and Germany's making the right noises, and, the, you know, it's a, um, so I uh, just... just so apologies to any Germans present, but you know it's where we're at. Um, and uh, so, so, uh, and a lot of that's happening in the U.S. because it's happening at, at sub subnational level. And again, this report provides, you know, Jerry Brown and his ilk with uh, hopefully the the rationale they need to assess their different options and decide what to do. Right. Thanks. More questions. Yeah, my question is probably a little related to the uh, to the last one, but it's uh, you, you mentioned earlier cooperation, and, and, and really, uh, I think the, the the governments have got to go and cooperate, but more together rather than just working independently. They've got to get solutions which are more more global solutions. I give just one example. For instance, I was volunteering in Tanzania, and Tanzania wants to have a deep water gas project, 
and that deep water gas project is going to kick start their economy. But on the other hand, that deep water gas project is going to add expensive fossil fuel to the, uh, to, to the planet. So how do you balance you know, the, the development aspects there in, in say, in Tanzania with the, uh, with, with, the, with the global aspects? So I think cooperation has got to be not just uh, looking at what happens in India or, or in, in China. You've just got to look more globally. Comments on cooperation? Um, sure, I mean, and, and also I mean, the, the nice thing about this process was just quite how cooperative, I mean, I didn't really feel like it at some points during the week, about, but it was, it was a remarkably cooperative, collaborative process. Um, no, 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 but the, the countries were, co I mean, the countries were cooperating, and the, the report was passed by consensus. In the end, there were no dissenting countries, and they all accepted what, what was said in the report. You know, there's not that many processes left. I mean, so, so in a sense, it, it, the process itself um, is an example of the kind of cooperation we need. And I'm also convinced that um, having talked to a few delegates in Paris um, in the COP21, um, just, just in formal conversations, I was really struck by how proud, these were developing country delegates, I was struck by how proud they were of the IPCC fifth assessment. They really felt that they owned the findings of that assessment and that they'd been through it, they accepted it, and that everybody accepted it. And that was the common ground that they were negotiating on when they were negotiating the Paris Agreement. And I think without that common ground, I don't think they, well, I don't know, others here might be able to better, better, better place to comment here, but, but it seems to me that it would have been a lot harder to have actually got the Paris Agreement um, through if it hadn't been for that you know, leveling of the scientific playing field beforehand through the IPCC process. Okay, Yuri, you wanted to add something on cooperation? Yeah, I think, I mean, I agree with Miles. In, 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 these, in, in the IPCC process, you actually see quite a collaborative spirit and, and, um, and ultimately governments agreeing on, uh, on the science. However, I, I also don't want to be just naively saying that everything is, is, is going really well because uh, we all know that, for example, in the UNFCCC, uh, several billions of dollars were, were promised to developing countries to, for, for the Green Climate Fund and, for other, um, and, and, and through other means to basically, uh, to basically kick, start or, or kick start these transformative changes in those countries. And, um, and, and that fund is basically not being replenished as, uh, as it should be. Um, so, yeah, while, while, while there are good indications, or, I mean, as long as it's, as long as go governments talk, they seem to, in, in some cases, get along quite well. But ultimately, it, it is about uh, money flows uh, and, and support in, in, in hard dollars for developing countries. And, and there, it's, it's not going always very, very smoothly. OK, interesting reflections. Further questions? We've got one at the front here. Um, yes. Um uh, Miles was extremely reassuring when he told us that the delegates had taken the message on board. Now, I haven't had the pleasure of reading this latest report, but the previous reports have been criticized for being a little too conservative and perhaps not placing sufficient emphasis on potentially um, out-of-control positive feedback effects. Um, can you say that you actually got into this and said that the danger of, say, ice sheets sliding as a whole is real and that they don't all have to melt in order to raise the sea level. That the tendency for thinking, probably may go away and thinking in rather linear terms about this when the real problem is highly non-linear in nature and we're talking about major instabilities which didn't get much air time in the previous report. So. Can you reassure me that the, the report has done something to correct this? And also, has it done something to stamp on? There's a lot of um, con artists in the, in the climate and environmental field putting forward useless solutions that absorb resources and not, don't produce any results. Okay. Uh, okay, so, so on the, on the um, overly conservative aspect, I mean, we, we have to try and give a balanced assessment to the literature um, in a sense, 1.5, by the, by the framing of the question, it was a little bit easier than, than a um, conventional IPCC assessment report. 
because we are just by definition, because you're talking about relatively small changes in temperature, the number of the number of tipping points you need to worry about is less. Um, that said, uh, we obviously did have to look um, carefully at um, the question of whether the were whether the were thresholds between 1.5 and 2 was clearly one of the big questions that Chapter 3 um, uh, had to address. Um, I mean. I, this is neither of us were actually on that chapter, but that um, they they didn't find uh, a, aside from unique and threatened systems like corals, they did not find um, evidence for um, global scale discontinuities like collapse of ice sheets being particularly highlighted in that um, temperature interval. Um, but they did, of course, note that the risks go up for every additional half a year of warming. Um, so, uh, you know, is I guess on impacts, I guess only time will tell whether this report was um, overly conservative or not. But what I can say is that the authors of, of Chapter Three, in particular, they were they were very um, they were very careful to try and get the balance right coming out of the literature. And we are, in the end, as the IPCC, just reliant on you know, what's available in the public literature to give that assessment. And maybe, Yuri, similarly, could you comment on the extent to which um, the process helped sort of highlight, I guess, what are mainstream views um, without discounting or, where appropriate, discounting other kinds of options and pathways? Yeah, this, this would have not be for the impact, but for the pathway. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Yeah, so yeah, it's, it, it, that's a really good question. I mean... It, for in the pathway literature, you have kind of the same kind of um, questions always being raised. Uh, pathways are either overly ambitious because they assume one technology to be able to, to scale up really largely, or they're too conservative because they don't use a technology that someone decided is, uh, it will be really very, very important. So, um, and, and in previous IPCC reports, kind of always grouped everything together and then, and then looked at, at, at the overall uh, evolution. And in, in this report, we, for the first time, um, actually following up on, a, on an IPCC process for, for about uh, how to better communicate insights um, to a wider audience, we actually went about and, and selected four illustrative pathways that really show um, different ways of doing the transition. And, um, and they, these four illustrative pathways really sh show the range that is available in the literature um, without excluding any of those. And then afterwards, uh, within the chapter, they're then being discussed uh, in terms of their feasibility or, or in, in terms of their consistency with current trends and so on. So um, it, it is always a very, uh, a very delicate balancing act. And say. no prizes for guessing that the pathway that's most consistent with current trends is the one which is least feasible with regard to 1.5. Of course. <laughs> and I mean, for those of you who haven't seen that, I think those four illustrative pathways are quite a nice way also to communicate the information from that particular chapter. I think it's really clear and it's a nice example of how this IPCC report, I think, has taken a step forward in being communicable. I don't know, some of the diagrams. Okay, we've got more questions. My hands going up at uh, the, the front here, and then let's hear both questions together. One at the front there, and one behind. Uh, good evening. Uh, yeah. Could you please yeah, talk yeah, about yeah. how the process works once the report has been written, and then it has to be signed off by governments? Um, so I think there were some reports that it would be a struggle not to have the SFP watered down. Is that an accurate de depiction? Um, well, as I say, just going to take a second question. Oh, sorry. Hmm? Thanks very much. And um, this is in no way meant to disparage your work. Um, but uh, I think it was last month the U.S. government announced they were contributing something like a billion dollars to a new satellite to map ice sheets using some sort of laser system. Um, at what point do we have enough research and information and should we instead be devoting resources to mitigation? Take Which the SPM answer? question, I, 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 or you want to take the I, I, I'll answer the second <laughs> question. Uh, you can do the SPM question. Um, yeah, I think, I think the physics of the problem is quite clear now, but that doesn't mean that we don't need to know what is going on. And, for example, particularly in ice sheets, um, 
we know we know quite a bit about the dynamics that could happen, but we don't really know how it, how they turn out to happen in the in, in reality. So it's really critical uh, for resilience. Uh, and, and, and in order to be able to plan, to understand what is going on. Um, and, and so, so I, I really think that both Earth observations uh, and, and mitigation actions should be continued uh, as, as, as an important policy uh, by, by governments. I, I don't see, I mean, I don't see the need for, for Earth observations disappearing. I mean, if, if the ice is going to collapse, I'd, I'd sure as heck like to know beforehand. I mean, or at least as soon as possible. <laughs> you know, if we're going to have to evacuate London, then you know, it might be useful to know, you know, 50 years in advance. Um, I mean, so, so yeah, no, those, those observations are critical. Um, uh, of course, in, in a sense, a little bit like some of these sort of early warning systems, you kind of hope that they'll never matter. But if they do matter, they'll matter a lot. Um, so, and do you want to comment on the SPM? Uh, on, the, on the SPM, um, I mean... That's, there's always that nervousness beforehand about these things, um, but it, it works both ways. And the point of the process is for governments, which have, all have very different skin in the game, um, to make sure that you, we end up with a balanced summary. So, you know, there were governments there that were very concerned um, that certain um, strong messages were in the summary, um, maybe would have been happier for some of the messages to be even stronger than were that. I mean, the, the, you know, the um, governments who feel they're particularly vulnerable to climate change were, were very keen to make sure. I mean, Yuri mentioned the, the, the droughts question. You know, um, countries who were concerned that they might be adversely affected by drought exacerbated by climate change wanted that point made uh, or were, you know, certainly didn't want that point missed if it was... And, and so there was quite a lot of discussion about whether there was really strong enough evidence to say whether climate change was contributing to drought in a particular region, for example. And, you know, where there was evidence to support that, we, we reported it, and where there wasn't, we didn't. I mean, that's, that's the way the process works. So, so the pressure is absolutely not always towards watering down. It's sometimes, what's the opposite of watering down? Um, <laughs> concentrating. Um, uh, uh, and uh, so... Uh, so, so um, uh, yeah, so, so, so it works both ways, and, and, and the, the virtue of the process is, you know, because of every country has a, essentially a veto on each paragraph, uh, if a country feels really strongly that something hasn't represented the risks they face or the issues that concern them accurately, then they can put their flag up and say, no, we're not happy with it. Um, and so, you know, in the end, that's why I'm, we're, we're pleased that we got as, as clear a report as we did, notwithstanding the comments about... Uh, some paragraphs being potentially clearer. Right. Yeah, and I, I just want to echo this and also, I mean, and also, and also say that there were also quite a few surprises in, in the ultimate summary for policymakers that we as, as authors did not think would ever survive uh, or, or would actually get into the, this. If you look at, uh, there's a figure, SPM 3B, which has a large table underneath it uh, that details for, for each energy source, for each fossil fuel individually, uh, how it evolves in 1.5 degree pathways. If you would have asked, I think, any uh, author uh, at the beginning, before the plenary, that table was also not there before the plenary started, whether such a table would be something that you would get through approval, we would say, no, not necessarily. But the governments asked for it. And they wanted to see, and, and now it's there in, in minute detail, uh, how, what happens to each, to, to oil, to gas, to coal, uh, to nuclear. I mean, you can already imagine yourself which red flags would go up with, with, with governments, but it's there. And it was actually supported. It was, it was quite uncontroversial. So, so sometimes there are really positive surprises that you see that governments really just want the evidence and the information. And so, yeah, at least I was, I very much felt that in the end it was still the, the, the researchers or the, or the authors that had the last say and, and were able to, to make sure that what was there was robust. Great. We've got time for a couple more questions. Can I encourage, oh, there we go. There, one question there and then um, 
you've already had the chance to answer a question. I'm not going to stop you from asking a question. I'm going to take this question now, and if we've got time, I'll come back. And anyone else who hasn't asked a question, go for it. Hi, uh, Yuri. Could you tell us a bit more about um, what specific collaborative options are available in the modeling pathways that solved? Because uh, I found that kind of a bit hard to get my head around exactly what was done in those uh, those runs and perhaps this might be a bit of a cheeky follow-up but what that might mean for a rich developed nation with relatively low emissions on the global scale like the UK kind of mm. what should they do and when yeah, yeah there's a, that's a really good question I mean ultimately boils down to how, how do you translate those aggregated insights of those global modeling pathways to something that you do on the national scale or even the local scale. And so most of these collaborative assumptions in those pathways, by the way, which we didn't model, we took them from the literature, but we looked at the assumptions underlying them, they translate in, for example, how, how you assume technology costs to evolve in the future. If you, assume, uh, if you assume regions to collaborate, you assume technology costs to converge across regions, to, you, you assume, um, first of all, technology costs to come down faster, you assume also that uh, developing regions get access to the latest technologies and so on. Um, in, um, if, on the contrary, if you assume no collaboration, you, the, these, these model pathways consider that there is still a strong discrepancy. Uh, developing regions um, have, to, have to continue for 30, 40 years with, with kind of second grade technologies and, and so on. So um, that's really kind of the way uh, it, it is modeled. It's also kind of modeled in, in what happens in terms of uh, income distributions in the world, uh, in, in, in more collaborative worlds. Um, you would see again a convergence of not, not a total convergence, but a slight convergence that leads not an increase of inequities. Um, and, and these are the kind of the, group, the, the major macroeconomic assumptions that, that have been made. So if you translate this to the, the local scale, the national scale, I, I would say, um, well, invest in, in, in really. In, in, in collaborative programs, in, 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 in development cooperation that actually matters on, 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 on large-scale process, on, uh, on large-scale projects, on, uh, on getting technology uh, also being implemented in the latest technology and the newest development implemented in developing countries. Um, and I know that there is a there are issues with uh, intellectual property and so on. So these are really barriers, there we have them, uh, that need to be surmounted. Uh, but um, that's kind of how you would translate those global assumptions into some more practical. Just a specific example. Um, the um, uh, first outreach event I did um, on this report was in, in Dhaka in Bangladesh, uh, where Everybody's very concerned about the impacts of climate change on Bangladesh, and they're also building coal-fired power stations. Um, and um, at the moment, uh, to my knowledge, unless it's happening very quietly behind closed doors, which it may well be, um, the UK is not really involved in the discussion about Bangladesh's energy future. Um, and I think that's something that we should be much more involved in, um, accepting that if we are, if they are going to move on to a low carbon path, or if they are going to implement CCS on their coal fired power stations or whatever that they decide to do, they have a completely reasonable call on um, developed country resources to help them do that. Um, I mean, that's, you know, that's the conversation that needs to be happening. I mean, at the end of the day, UK's emissions, 1% and declining, we can have a lot more impact in other countries than we potentially have here. Okay, great. Well, we've got a couple minutes left, so I'm going to take the prerogative of asking you one quick last question, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, just to bring it back to sort of your experience personally in being a lead author, obviously it takes, I assume, and you can tell us how much of your time it's taken over the past year and a half, probably more than you anticipated um, going in. What was perhaps the thing you took away from it most as a, as a person, but also professionally? 
<laughs> I can start. Uh, you want, you want to start. Yeah, I, I can. I can. I can start. Um, may, may, maybe two things. Um, on a um, uh, on a on a personal level, uh, the 1.5 degree topic has been a topic that I've been interested in for for a while. I've been publishing on for around seven or eight years now. So it was really nice, um, and 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 publishing on that came from a from a concern um, that or also from from a knowledge that for some countries this was this was really important and it was really nice that uh, to see that literature develop in the in the scientific literature and now being assessed in the IPCC and being and being presented as a uh, yeah as, as as one of the options to be, to be considered so that was really uh, that was something that that I found found very uh, very nice, uh, and then also on a, on a, on another level, this was the first IPCC report that brought together the different working groups mm -hmm. of the IPCC. So there are three working groups: one on on the physical science, one on the impacts, and one on climate mitigation. And it was the first time that those three working groups, in in the 30 years the IPCC exists, that they made that they did a report together. Mm -hmm. And um, as someone working on interdisciplinary topics and and and, and doing interdisciplinary research, that was also one of, uh, I think, a, a huge step forward for the IPCC and, and also kind of ex extremely um, motivating for me to be involved in, in such an endeavor. Great, really interesting. And Miles, your reflections? Um, well, after AR5, I'd um, faithfully promised my wife I wouldn't be involved in an IPCC report again. Um, so when the invitation came for this one, I was in a tricky position. And the way I rationalized it to myself is you've kind of got to say yes if you think something might be either a roaring success or a complete disaster. And I could see both of those as possible outcomes of this report. I think we avoided the second one. Um, and um, it, so, you know, that respect on, a, on, a, on an entirely negative level it was a, it was great um, <laughs> because it, um, but um, and the, the reason I, I felt it could have been a, a disaster was that I was unlike Yuri I, I was one of the scientists probably the majority of the world scientists who were totally caught out by Paris and the mention of 1.5 in Paris didn't didn't see it coming um, was sort of what do we know about this um, and a lot of scientists similarly felt do we actually know? Is there any is there any detectable difference between 1.5 and 2? Many colleagues I talked to about when when the report was first mooted said, "What's the point um, of, of of doing this assessment? Because you know it's it's almost inside the noise." And the risk of the report, you know, the 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 sort of disaster scenario I had was the report coming out saying, "We can't really tell the difference between 1.5 and 2. We can't really get to 1.5 anyway." Um, what's the point? Um, and then subsequent research revealing that not to be the case, and a lot of developing countries who pressed very hard for this report feeling really badly let down. Um, so I don't think we ended up in that position. I'm pleased we didn't. But I think there was a non-zero risk of us ending up there. So that's why I got involved. Great. Brilliant. Well, thank you both for your reflections. Um, just to, to, we're going to wrap it up now so that we're finishing nearly on time. <laughs> um, this week is Green Great Britain Week. For those of you who don't know, uh, the government's promoting a large number of events throughout this week, many of them about climate change, but also about a full, uh, full range of environmental uh, issues uh, that the UK government in particular is taking on. Many institutions like ourselves, the Grantham Institute, um, are carrying out other events. So do check our newsletter and our website for what's going on, but also check out what Bayes has at a central level, and things are happening all around the country as well. Um, on our campus, later this week on Thursday, we have something particularly on innovation called Greenovate from 6 till 9 in our entrance foyer, which is just roughly speaking there, but where you came in. Um, you can come and see what kind of new innovations are coming out of uh, this university and our wider innovation community um, in relation to tackling air pollution, climate change and a whole load of other things, there's chances to get involved. So please do look those up. And I hope you'll join me in thanking both Yuri and Miles for joining us. Thank you.